bulletin of the atomic scientists, this is dedicated to the risks of exposure to low-level radiation. And uh, I'm primarily, in some great measure, concerned about veterans and about their exposures to what is euphemistically referred to as DU, something I'd rather call radioactive weaponry. And while the Department of Death, or DOD, whatever you want to call them, the Department of Defense, if they will acknowledge at all a health effect, generally they will dismiss it by saying, ah, oh, it's a low-level effect, therefore it has no consequence. And so, um, and I am very well informed. I'm bi-coastal. I'm in Nevada and I'm in Illinois. I'm very well informed about what's going on at the Nevada test site, which is a repository for low-level and bomb-grade nuclear waste. And I wonder if you could just very briefly give me a synopsis. <laughs> very briefly. If you could, if you could define low-level radiation very briefly, I know what it is. But for, the, for the, those who don't know, if you'd be so kind. Well, I think uh, I should bring Arjun up here if he's still here. I mean, there is no safe level of, um, you know, exposure to radioactivity. Um, and I think the National Academy of Sciences has, over several reports, suggested as much. Um, uh, you know, it's always a matter of cost-benefit. Uh, mammogram, you know, I get much more exposure than, from that than from hanging around a nuclear power plant. But I'm willing to, to um, go through that in order to, um, uh, for health reasons, dental x-ray is the same. So I think, um, th th yes, low-level radiation is, um, is something to be concerned about. But in, with all of these technologies in general, these are complicated things, and we need to be thinking about what the harm is as well as, and the benefits. And, uh, you know, for each of us, it's an individual thing, then we make that determination. Uh, the, the problem is when it comes to uh, a public exposure to low-level radiation. And I think that's where um, it's, it's even more difficult um, because it's not something you can control necessarily. Um, and it's something that you can't, it's hard to get a grip on. So that, um, the issue that we did in the bulletin was to an attempt to try to um, uh, tease out, untangle some of the complexities of the issue. Um, I will say, you know, we, we are <laughs> often sometimes called the voice of reason, sometimes we're not called that at all. But uh, I'll, I will comment that I got two responses, uh, several, but two in particular that I remember. One saying, well, I've read this uh, bulletin issue and it's really terrific and, and it's clear that we just, you know, there's just no safe level for this stuff and we should get rid of all of it. And the other one was, this is a great issue and well, I guess we just don't have anything to worry about. <laughs> so it tries to inform you. So uh, be informed. Thank you. Hello, uh, I'm John Bolenbaugh, and um, I'm a whistleblower for Tar Sands Oil. <laughs> uh, I have turned into an activist now and a reporter, and I make videos, and they're becoming worldwide. Um, slowly. Um, but now I'm having whistleblowers contact me, one from a nuclear power plant in Michigan. I can't say which one, but I'm about ready to make some major videos of your government cover-ups. And uh, yeah. Yeah. So, I came here to learn more about this, but um, I'm living um, an Aaron Brockers situation in Michigan. We have hundreds of sick people, and they're getting sicker all the time with seizures, people have died, cancer's on the rise. We had 40 miles of uh, river that was contaminated. And it's important for you people here in Chicago because they lied to you and the toxic uh, chemicals made it to the Great Lakes, uh, to Mich Lake Michigan, and that's where your fresh water comes from. That's where you drink from. And so I want to know, because I've heard today that it's radioactive, the bottom of our river is still full of oil. And I've already, from my videos, made them clean up over $100 million extra after they said a year and a half ago it was 100% clean from my videos. So can you tell me, can you tell me how radioactive tar sand oil is? Um, can you, I, I need to learn more about that, either from you or somebody later tonight that's in the audience. Uh, I, I don't know. I'm sure somebody heard me, so just approach me later. Yeah, I'm, I'm the whistleblower thing. Two thoughts. Um, 
be very careful not to not to fingerprint the, the person. And by even if they take their name off the file, um, that doesn't mean that there can't be retribution. I had a case where um, uh, uh, I made a mistake. The whistleblower contacted me. I, I could totally sanitize the information. And I gave it to the NRC through, uh, I always go, uh, my, my wife's advice here is right on the money. Uh, don't go directly to the NRC. Go to Congress and then have them give it to the NRC. It's, it, it's more protection for you, and it also looks likely to get results. But anyway, so I did that. Um, and I gave them three concerns. And then each concern was sanitized. The NRC took the three concerns and gave them to Oyster Creek. And there's only one, even though each concern was, was uh, sanitized and there was no fingerprint, there was only one person who could have done all three of those. And there was retribution. So, and of course, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is, is uh, really not interested in protecting people. So, just please be very careful. You don't inadvertently jeopardize a, a, a person's career, his family. Right. I, uh, when I reported the cover up um, that they were burying an oil instead of cleaning it up to save money, I was fired the next day. And so, thank, I, I won my lawsuit. And um, but this this whistleblower that I'm talking about, um, I I yeah I don't know what to do. I'm he's scared for his life. For yeah. real. Well, I get four death threats and slashed tires and cut brakes and everything already. Yeah. Hogo in, in Washington and there's also a couple others. Uh, POGO um, something yeah. program on government yeah. oversight can can help whistleblowers. Uh, that would be one and I'd go to. There's also a couple other stuff there too, but Pogo comes to mind. So I shouldn't just go through an attorney? Well, yeah, they, 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 would line you up with them. they would line the person up with an attorney, or yeah. if you call them a person's behalf, or whatever. But they'll, they're pretty good at not fingerprinting people, and yeah. they're also, they know how to work the bureaucracy. All right, thank you, sir. Yeah. Can I have a point on your question about whistleblowers? When I, when I blew the whistle, my wife and I went to the, the, the legislature in Connecticut and tried to pass a whistleblower protection law. And the first year we lost, you know, Northeast Utilities just overwhelmed us. But we, we, you know, it was okay because we educated a bunch of senators. The second year, we thought we won. And we had a great bill. This is in Northeast uh, in, in Connecticut. And it was honest protection for the whistleblowers. But behind the scenes, Northeast Utilities took the funding away. So it, it's not, you have to, what you're, from the, the, the person on the staff who was supposed to be doing whistleblower protection, they just eliminated the funding from that slide. So we, we lost, we thought we won and we lost. It's not, making a presentation in the state house is not enough. You really need a, a presence in the state house. Uh, the groups in Connecticut, uh, in Vermont rather, have a full-time lobbyist. And, and it took three years for what happened in Vermont. So one of the things I learned at the state level is you, you need a presence when you walk out of the room and the lobbyists for the other side do you not. Know. I, I really believe you need bodyguards. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think that's the only protection. And, and I, anytime I go do investigative work, I got uh, people that come with me now. So yeah. It's scary. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, I'm Beverly Walter, the local activist. Uh, my question is about uh, the Soviet Union. And um, after the former Soviet Union was dissolved, uh, it was broke. <laughs> and so they sold a lot of their weapons. And a lot of those apparently ended up in some kind of rogue nations that used to be a part of the Soviet Union. I think including the current called Moldavia which is down close to Romania and close to the Crimea. And this <clears throat> is, is quite a rogue nation. There have been books written about it. And it is selling those weapons in a kind of a black market criminal fashion. I'm just wondering um, if you're aware of that and if you think that maybe any nuclear weapons have leaked out into the criminal element, the worldwide criminal element, because apparently it's getting stronger and stronger. I'm not aware of the, um, uh, these are conventional weapons that have gone to Moldavia. Moldavia. Yeah, yeah. weapons, I don't know if there were any nuclear weapons or not, that's what I'm wondering. Yeah, I don't, uh, the, the um, after the breakup of the Soviet Union, 
Um, we worked very uh, diligently with the countries which were the inheritors of those weapons, Belarus, Ukraine, and Kazakhstan. And in fact, uh, we were able to move those weapons back to Russia. Um, and uh, through another, de several different efforts have managed to move uh, much of the fissile material out of um, those countries. So I don't, uh, uh, yes, yes, the Soviet Union, Russia was broke. And that's in fact why none of the senators, none of Lugar put in place the Cooperative Threat Reduction Program because they knew it would be difficult for them to dismantle and secure and their you know, there are horror stories about uh, where the material was kept and, you know, was a, just a padlock, for instance. So I, uh, we've, uh, over the last 25 years, have managed to secure something like 80 or 90 percent of the Soviet, or the former Soviet arsenals and material. Um, the IAEA does track um, uh, the uh, traffic in um, fissile material, either highly enriched uranium or plutonium, and um, there have been a certain number of incidents, and it is scary. Um, uh, and that's why uh, we have worked hard to get Congress to continue to fund these programs and see what they will. But I'm not aware of, there have been sting operations, and there have been, um, there has been material um, that has been picked up. Uh, but I don't believe that the kind of large-scale operation you're talking about, I, certainly I haven't heard. One, one thing, and I agree, there's no, I don't believe there's any missing nukes. But, but the, there are some handheld uh, weapons, you know, conventional weapons, that can poke the, side, the hole inside of a BWR fuel pool like Dresden and, and, and cause it to have a meltdown. So the, the conventional weapons are out there. and. Uh, we, as a country, have discounted the terrorist threat issue. Uh, but it's also the case that the U.S. is the greatest manufacturer, the largest manufacturer of conventional, of handheld, any kind of weapon. So it's our, there are ours. <laughs> My name is Gail Vaughn, and you had said, I believe you were quoting the NRC chairman, that the storage of the nuclear waste was not a technical problem, but a political problem. Maybe I misheard you, but no, it's not too much. Well, I'm not so sure that I agree with that. I think that it's still something of a technical problem. And I wanted to know if anyone here has any idea of what we should be doing with all of the stuff that we can more or less secure, the spent fuel rods, the fissile material, the former bombs, much less the stuff that's out of control already, like Hanford and Savannah River and Fushima. That's my question. Any, any ideas? Well, I'll, quickly, I'll just quickly, I'm not an expert, you know, I'm just, I leverage my ignorance and try to <laughs> listen to other people and try and put it all together. But, uh, but uh, my understanding from, from the folks that I talked to with the Bolts and other places is that, um, I mean, we do have to do something with it, right? Okay, <laughs> let's, let's do it like that. Right now, the dry cask storage, as I understand it, um, has the possibility, and you know, you'll talk to the expert in a minute, but I think what Allison is refer was referring to was that the dry cask storage uh, seems to be sufficient for now. It's better than leaving it in pools, open pools. Um, and I think her suggestion is that Yucca Mountain may not be a, at all a good place from a geologist's point of view. But, but she suggests that there are places in the United States where if you're looking for a permanent repository, actually Illinois wouldn't be bad. <laughs> because if you look at the geology right now, uh, there isn't much seismic activity. It's a lot, it's very, you know, it's not All I'm saying is that, uh, you know, we chose the West because that's where the weapons have gone off. People were used to dealing with this stuff. You know, we're there. the point is we need to find a solution to it. Yes. So, well, I've given you the ideas that I know about. And we will be discussing that tomorrow as well. Yeah. But, you know, when you find yourself in a hole, that's thing to do is to stop digging. So building, building more or running longer creates more of the waste that we still want to put in. I think it works. The dry casks, you know, seem to be what we'll be stuck with for 50 years or more. Um, whether or not to keep those on the sites or to consolidate them is a separate issue. Getting the material out of these fuel pools, uh, it would be a 
to avoid a problem like the fission of AGN4, which is an old fuel is in the pool, there's nothing in the reactor, and still the thing exploded. Um, we've got to get the fuel out of the fuel pools. And so our first priority has got to be to get it to dry chemists. And on Yapka, Yapka was, you know, it was not, it was, it was chosen politically despite the science. And so people will say, well, you know, this is this is a political thing and perhaps the science supports Yapka. No, it was the other way around. Yapka, the, the bill was originally called the, the you use the blight term, screw in the bottom. And, um, so Yapka may not be the right one. But some, somebody's got to take it sometime. But first, you got to stop taking it. I just wanted to talk about the last time I heard Jeff Patterson speak, he talked a lot about Alice Stewart, who was the person who did the original research on low-level radiation and its effect on the human body. And um, she said, uh, I read a little bit of some of the things she said, and one of them was that if a pregnant woman gets a, che uh, not a chest x-ray, a tooth x-ray, that uh, there's a certain percentage higher rate of leukemia in her in the offspring of a woman who has this while she's pregnant. And uh, but I just wanted to put out the name Alice Stewart to answer some of the questions about the effects of low-level radiation on the human body. I googled it and it worked. You can find it. Yeah, you can find Alice Stewart's work in the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, and uh, we the archives are on Google Books if you want. To. Oh, this, uh, my name is Cindy. Just to follow up on that, there's a book called The Woman Who Knew Too Much that was written about Alice Stewart. It's a whole lot. It's fantastic. Uh, I just want to mention that we've been talking about accidents. We haven't talked about waste accidents starting way back in the Chalk River. Uh, and then with Winscale in England, it was so critical. This plant blew up. The, it was like a mini Chernobyl. All the milk and vegetables had to... Yeah, but it blew up. Yes, but then it was so bad that the, when they started reprocessing, which is one of the dirtiest places in the whole world, and it hasn't been mentioned much to once today, Sellafield, uh, which is making a reprocessing, uh, they had to change the name from Winsdale to Sellafield. It's the same place. But they, but they, they're very good at name changing when you have an accident. Not to mention in 1957, Kristen. There have been three huge accidents in Europe, Russia. I can't pronounce it very well. But one that had all the waste in a lake, and the lake dried up, and all kinds of just, there were three of them, not just one. Nuclear waste accidents, not to mention Laguna down in Veracruz, Mexico, where they have these nukes on the beach, and they're very bad in third world countries because they just dump the waste on the beach. I could go on and on. I think we have to realize the seriousness of keeping this waste in the future. And one question, what's the name of the plant that's going to shut down this year? Kiwani. 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 The, the Kiwani plant in Wisconsin, that oh, is, uh, it's, it's a 600 megawatt plant, it's a single unit plant, and uh, the, the owner of the plant has decided that uh, uh, it makes no economic sense to run it, so it'll be shutting down. <laughs> We've said that on a couple of the latest experiments, I guess we talked about that, that there, the dominoes are starting to fall. These small single unit reactors, like Oyster Creek, um, or my Enki, and, and others, the commercial pressures on them to keep them running, especially in light of Fukushima modifications. Uh, I don't think Kiwani will be the only plant to shut down. I think we'll see. Also, I'd like to add that Canada, Quebec's only reactor, Jean T, is shutting down by the end of 2012. That was me. That was a political decision made by the new provincial government. Mm -hmm. I'm Tim Coates from the state of Michigan, and I think that we should uh, at least address, I mean, as, as a peace-loving person, we should at least address the fact that we are we have to stop consuming so much. We have to demand more conservation of energy and not be lured and misled by the energy industry that we need more and more and more energy. About four years ago, I was somebody who mobilized along with uh, Dave Kraft, working with NEIS, uh, on the potential for argon being on a very short list for nuclear waste, uh, doing the research and development for nuclear waste reprocessing at Morris. 
And uh, I found it very effective to go to village hall, city councils, getting resolutions, explaining it to them, resolutions of opposition. We, we prefer halves if the choices that exist uh, versus transport. Uh, GNUP was the vehicle. And I know GNUP was zeroed out. But I also know that its name changed. And uh, the International Framework on Nuclear Energy Cooperation, I think, or something like that. And I Google it every now and then, notice that they still hold meetings. And uh, they have quite a following, because I think under Bush, 26 countries signed up and said, sell us reactors, and we were to take the waste off their hands. So I think that, I don't know if this has been brought up in any of these discussions, but it's not just our waste. It, I mean, it's everyone's. But if the politics are such that, obviously, the Bush administration's stand on it was adopted, or we would have done the same thing, uh, Obama, because I think five or six more countries joined on. There's something like 31 of them. And then they have observer countries that are in the 30s or 40s for signing up to this. Can you shed any light on this international framework and where things stand? I probably should turn to Steve Schwartz on this one. I'm not as well informed as I should be, but um, GNAP is not, yes, you're right, it's been zeroed out. I think, you know, there are continuing conversations though throughout the industry about how to meet energy needs. There is an international nuclear industry, and um, it, it, in this country, because of the market forces and the costs, um, there are very large pressures to uh, not build anymore. You know, it costs about well, eighteen billion dollars to build one. Small modular reactors are one solution to it, and in a way, I suppose that's kind of uh, you know the, the uh, one of the uh, uh, kind of remaining remnants from uh, Gina. But um, but it, it continues to be an, an issue, and, and it's you know I think there's some. Uh, progress, especially if we can close some of the older reactors here. But, uh, you know, unless we've got international partners on this, um, I think it's going to be a continuing, continuing issue. It still is, a, to some, an attractive way of going. Well, the partnership seems to be one side of it, because we can take in the West. Well, sure. Right. Well, again, we take the West. Right. Exactly. Well, part of the issue is um, <coughs> we don't want to continue to promote weapons proliferation. So if there is, um, you know, weapons grade material or think enough radio, enough um, uranium coming from those that can be diverted or reprocessed in a way that would make for a weapon, we'd rather not do that. So it's an international problem. Um, it's almost better that we take it back, frankly, than leave it there, in my view, uh, because I think we'll at least have the technology and it's for some of the countries more wealth to, to manage it. So we can ship it out, but it may come back to haunt us. I have a question that I don't believe pertains specifically to your expertise, but maybe someone else here can answer it. Um, over a year and a half ago when Fukushima Daiichi uh, had this terrible disaster, uh, there was in the news, in the general media, reports occasionally about the extent of radiation fallout, both in the air and in the water. I haven't heard anything like that in over a year. And I have not seen any reports or any, even if any monitoring is going on to this day from that terrible incident. I know that, I, as I remember, there were uh, statements about the fact that our west coast was affected. I don't remember the severity of those uh, apparent reports of how affected it was uh, and how much of that radiation contamination has shifted towards the east, even as far as this area of the country. Is anyone monitoring? Yeah. Um, there's a lot of this information on the, on the Fairwind site, if you, if you, if you check. Um, I, um, I wrote a book on this, and it's a bestseller in Japan. So it's in Japanese, so it's not my book. You know, when, when the accident happened, the day the accident happened, I knew there was a meltdown happening. And um, this is the fundamental, one of the fundamental turning points in my life. Um, I had been an expert on Three Mile Island, and I saw my government cover up that accident. Uh, 
um, radiation releases were probably something on the order of 10 to 100 times higher than what the NRC will still say. And, and so I, I turned to Maggie and I said, you know, I, I don't care what it takes. I'm not going to let it happen a second time. And that's really whether we put the videos up on the site and things like that. But, so they, the, but the issue is um, uh, the authorities, whether by AEA or the, or the Japanese government, have consistently underestimated the, uh, the radiation. I was in Tokyo in, uh, uh, in February, and um, I was, was on the on the book tour, and I brought plastic bags with me. And every day I would walk outside and grab some dirt from where I was. And I ran this. Uh, I came back at the the dirt, brought them through customs officially, and you have to declare it dirt when you bring it back, and then sent it to a lab. And all five bags would qualify as radioactive waste here in the country. And this was on the streets of Tokyo. So. Um, you know, what, what we would have to ship to Texas and, and store uh, by our standards in Tokyo was, uh, was ubiquitous. Um, the, the, um, I was there again in, in August and I was over on Niigata, which is on the opposite coast on the Sea of Japan. And it didn't get nailed by the, by the plume so much. But the mountains between Fukushima Prefecture and Niigata are contaminated. And now their sediment in their rivers is loaded with radiation as well. Um, they're, um, <coughs> they're, the, the, in addition to the exposure people are picking up with their handheld inspectors and you know, the devices, the Geiger counters that people have, um, there's, there's also a lot of hot particle contamination where people have ingested the material. Um, we have cases where we have house dust but that we're getting, people are sending us vacuum cleaner bags of, of dust. And uh, uh, one of the bags, which was examined over in England, it was uh, 100,000 percent radiations per second in, in a two pound bag of dust. And that goes on, of course, for, you know, for centuries. So the Japanese sleep on the floor. So the dust that's on the floors in their lungs and, and I am at the, based on my experiences from I, I think over the next 30 or 40 years, we can see a million cancers as a result. I understand that that's an extreme view. Um, but uh, when you look at Steve Wing's work at, at TMI, um, I, and I extrapolate linearly from that, um, I, I think we're going to see a lot of cancers. Right now we see uh, an enormous, in Fukushima Prefecture, 40% um, of the of the kids tested have thyroid nodules. The normal number is 1%. Thyroid nodules are a precursor for cancer. So we're at the beginning of that experience and it's alienating um, women especially and causing Fukushima divorces. I could go on about this. We'll talk out the hall. So you're saying that I can at some point in the future begin buying fruits and vegetables from California because over time the current level yeah. of radiation will be not now, we're at a point in the US uh, um, Seattle and uh, especially Seattle but as far north as Vancouver and as far south as Portland uh, got nailed in March and April <coughs> and we've got good science behind that. Uh, we had air filters out in Seattle in March and in April and uh, they're called camps, continuous air monitors. Essentially, you pull air through a cigarette filter. And then every day, you take that filter out, put a new one in. And then you roll the filter out and put it in a, um, um, you, you lay it on an x-ray film. And uh, the people in Seattle wound up, and the rate at which the air filter was pulling air in was uh, 10 cubic meters a day, which is about what your lungs breathe. And we were finding 10 hot particles a day from Fukushima Daiichi during March and April for Seattle. So yes, Seattle got nailed um, nowhere near what the Japanese got, maybe a thousand times less. Uh, but um, but at this point, you know, it's washed into the soil and I'm not worried about what's coming from terrestrial sources here in the States anymore. I'm, I'm very worried about the uh, top of the line, the top of the food chain fish that are in the Pacific, and I don't think that's peaked yet. Well, thank you to Canada.